Welcome to Identified. What I want is an acknowledgement of what happened, an acknowledgement of my childhood, that it was real <laughs> and uh, that it affected me. If my mother specifically is willing to go there, then I'm willing to be an adult and say, all is forgiven. Now, can we have an adult relationship based on unconditional love? Hello, I'm Nabil Ayers, author, music executive, and host of Identify, the podcast that delves deep into the complex world of family and identity. In this episode, my guest is the musician, Norman Brannon. In my early 20s, I was a big fan of Texas is the Reason, the influential New York City post-hardcore band that Norman founded in 1994. And I knew about the fanzine, Antimatter, which he started in 1993 and resurrected in 2023. But I had no knowledge of Norman's fascinating background. Leaving home at 16 after a difficult childhood, Norman found connection among Hare Krishnas before ultimately forging his own path. After a terrible accident left him hospitalized as an adult, Norman had a breakthrough with his mother, finally receiving acknowledgement of his traumatic childhood. After Norman's parents passed away, he dug deeper into his family history and learned more about his indigenous Mapuche roots. Norman has a unique definition of family. He explains that through researching the lost language Polari, he realized the deep ingenuity and resilience that has connected queer people across centuries. In our conversation, Norman explains how the instant familiarity and lack of translation needed between queer people makes queerness his primary ethnicity. To Norman, family can be defined as sitting down with someone of any background and not having to explain yourself or your experiences. We dig further into this in my conversation with Norman. Here it is. I guess where I can start is that my family, first of all, I come from an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. So my mother's from Colombia and my dad's from Chile. They came to America and they met here. And no other extended family lived in America. So basically, if I had any extended family, it was in Bogota or in Santiago. But I never met anyone because right. we never went to those places because we were poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, right off the bat, my idea of family was you know, the very nuclear structure. It was me and my brother and my mother and my father. There was also a half brother from my mother's first marriage. Mm. Her first husband died in Vietnam. And so that brother, you know, I wish I could tell you more about him. I haven't seen him since I was eight. Is he older? He's 10 years older. Mm. He went to school in Columbia and he basically just decided that he was just going to live there. That's sort of an interesting decision that I've never followed up on. Right. <laughs> but it was, it was a weird <clears throat> disconnect. And I don't know if, if it was because things back then were a little bit different when you had these mixed families of children from different fathers, let's say. Right. Maybe there was some sort of weird political thing. The other aspect of it is that like my parents were Pentecostal and Latino Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. So that's like a near cult-like sort of situation. So my family was very insular was very small and it was very secretive. And the secrets sort of even, you know, extended themselves to where we come from. So what I mean by that is I knew that my mom was Colombian and I knew that her ancestry was Spanish and Portuguese. So that was always sort of very open and in the air. Mm -hmm. My father when I would do those things, like when you're a kid and be like, where are we from? Right. <laughs> he would say, I was born in Santiago. And I was like, okay, but. <laughs> like withholding something. Yeah. Like yeah. where does, what is, where do we come from though? Like, where do you have like, you know, ancestors or anything? You know, and he would just say, I was born in Santiago. Mm -hmm. So it was like a very Stockholm syndrome-y kind of. I'm soldier eight, two, three, four, five. You know, it was, I was born in right. Santiago. And you didn't know your grandparents because they were not at all baby there or yeah, they weren't I here. I vaguely knew that he had sisters in Chile, but I didn't, never met them, never talked to them. And so I would go to my mom and say, well, what's the deal? Why is he doing this? And my mom would just say, oh, leave him alone. I don't even know. And so I, right off the bat, there was this sense of incompletion in my family tree. There was a sense of like, well, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that created a situation for me where 
it was difficult for me to look at family through the lens of ethnicity or, or culture because I had no connection to it. My family were very much of the immigrant mind of the American dream and, you know, fuck where we come from, right, moving we're forward. here, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and so, you know, it was to the point where even language, you know, they disconnected me from the language when I was five or six years old and started going to school. They had this idea that if I continued to speak Spanish, I would start speaking English with a Spanish accent. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and it would be known who you were and that would be bad. Right. right. Like their whole goal here was that my brother and I were going to be successful Assimilate. Americans. Yeah. 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 <laughs> where, so, where did you live at the time? In Woodside, Queens. Oh, okay. So, which has its own other <laughs> element of, of secrecy that sort of I discovered as an adult, which was that the whole time I was growing up, I only really knew other Latino kids, black kids. And if you were white, you were Greek. That was pretty much all I knew. And then as I grew up and as the internet happened, I remember looking up Woodside on the internet. And the first thing you read about it is, Woodside is a famous Irish American enclave. And I was like, the fuck? I didn't know any Irish people. <laughs> you're, you're an adult learning this or older. At, well, at this point I'm an adult, but okay. as a, I only lived there as a child. Right, okay. And so we only went to certain places in the neighborhood and I realized that there was this whole other Woodside on the other side of the track, so to speak. <laughs> Weird. I mean, New York can be so like that, though, right? There's like many, many immigrant centers or many countries almost where like, if you want to, you can just remain in that and be around the people you want to be. Right. And to be fair, like, you know, Queens being such, you know, the largest it's immigrant huge. center, yeah. right. even back then. Right. And Irish people were immigrants at one point, too. So they did create enclaves. It's right. just that we never saw each other. Interesting. <laughs> it was a very partitioned neighborhood, I suppose. Did you consider yourself, were, were you a Latino family to you? Or were you just to a me, family? Or To me, Latino, yeah. Mm. Um, but that's, it, again, it was Latino pause. It was because I didn't have the same types of connections with the culture that other people in the neighborhood did like you know our neighbors oh god what were their names now they were children i remember louis and uh, his brother but they were puerto rican mm -hmm. and i remember that was like a real they had a real understanding of puerto rican food puerto rican music yeah. you know it especially was, in new york or in queens yeah. i mean it's like a real pride yeah it was very pronounced and mm -hmm. i didn't have that necessarily there was a colombian bakery in our neighborhood so i was like oh cool like i would go there and get you know pan de yuca or something mm -hmm. but like there was no sense of really understanding where my mom came from. Right. And definitely no sense of where my dad came from. So I always felt displaced. I didn't really feel American either. Mm. Right. I mean, you're a child of immigrants and you're just sort of like, you're just, you're just there. <laughs> right. Um, and so for a long time, I didn't consider that, or I, I considered that to be sort of a negative experience. And at some point, somebody said something to me that has stuck with me where I was sort of explaining that entire scenario to them. And they were like, well, that is a Latino experience. And I was like, oh, you know, actually, you're right. <laughs> right, right. In America, that is a quintessential Latino experience. Right, being an outsider. And also, or just, you know, being a child of immigrants or being disconnected from your language even. Mm -hmm. You know, like the language thing was always a big thing for me because I have this relationship with Spanish that is weird. Like, I understand it fluently. I can watch Spanish television. I can read Spanish books. I'm like completely connected to it. But when I have to speak it, it's like, <laughs> huh. I feel like a poser. <laughs> right. So you, you could or you can, but you don't feel comfortable. Once I'm like, if I'm immersed in a Spanish speaking country, right. it starts to come more fluently. Does it depend who you're talking to? Maybe actually like with strangers, it's better. Right. That's not where I'm going with it, yeah. Because they're not going to judge you as much as yeah. someone else might, yeah. Right, yeah. It's weird. I've never thought about that. But it's it's very... I do feel like when I'm doing it, when I'm speaking the language, I feel more whole. But there just aren't many opportunities for me right. to do that. So it's part of you. Yeah. And you feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Were there traditions or things growing up? Did your parents... I mean, was it thanksgiving and christmas and were they trying to just like we're americans now or did did they bring oh, things from from the immigrant past they brought nothing yeah. <laughs> uh, and honestly we barely celebrated thanksgiving and christmas it was a very difficult 
situation. When I when I say that I speak negatively of my family, there are a couple things at play. So one is that my family, or specifically my mother, was physically abusive to me from pretty much as early as I can remember to about 12 or 13. Yeah. And 12 or 13 being the age where I was old enough to defend myself and or fight back. Wow. So I always felt a disconnection from her very specifically. And then a further disconnection from my father in the sense that there was this feeling of why aren't you protecting me? But mm. she was very much the head of household. Mm. He worked three jobs. Wow. Um, he was never home. So he felt like I have no say in this home. Right. Like, I'm, I'm out providing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm basically paying the rent and putting food on the table. And that's, that's all I can do. And over the years, I've come to sort of accept that more. But at the time, I was very resentful. Yeah. So there was that. On top of that, there was this sort of Pentecostal shield, I'll call it, which is that these things that were happening, which I thought were wrong, were shielded by God, meaning that it was her duty to beat us, essentially. <laughs> and so that kind of created this schism for me with religion. And on top of that, again, Latin Pentecostalism is very much, it's a race-based religion. Mm. It's very rooted in, like, these were the only Latino people that we would see. All the so, Pentecostal <laughs> families in, yeah. in this very small part of Queens. Yeah, and it was, it was very much like, that was where the culture was happening, if it was happening anywhere, it was in the church. So those two things right off the bat kind of completely made me feel othered, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then on the third leg of that is the fact that I can tell you that probably at least from the age of five, I knew I was gay. So throw that into the mix where I know I'm gay. I'm in a church that talks about gay people constantly. <laughs> not, not in a good way. Right. <laughs> as evil, as hellbound. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I have this mom that's abusing me and this dad who is more or less the classic sort of like Latin machismo kind of guy. And I'm sort of like this sensitive bookworm kid. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds hard. So I, I basically... I spent, I'd say, my entire childhood completely disconnected. And it's one of the reasons why I left home when I, as soon as I turned 16, I left home. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where'd you go? So originally, I went to New Jersey and crashed on a friend's couch mm -hmm. for as long as I could. And then this gets into a weird part of the story, but I become a Hare Krishna and, <laughs> and I move into a temple wow. and became a monk. Uh, this happened when I was like 17. In New Jersey? So originally in Philly, and then I came back to Brooklyn and did a year in Brooklyn at the temple here. Wow. So, um, and then I think I left when I was in about 19 or something. What do you think you were looking for there? What, what did you hope to find? Was it? Well, this was clearly related to my issues. <laughs> I didn't, obviously, like my, my experience with my family's religion was difficult, if not adversary. The weird thing is, I don't even know that I was even a hardcore theist. But when I met the Hare Krishnas, they really did have this communal, familial sort of thing. And the person who became my guru in the Hare Krishnas, I met him when I was 15. I was on a Hare Krishna farm in Pennsylvania, and I was hanging out with some friends, and he was there. And, you know, usually I got ignored places that I went, and he sort of like sat down next to me one day. I was just like, what's up with you? Right. <laughs> and we... It's nice when you're not used to that, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and we developed this relationship. He lived in India at the time. And so I was, you know, I would write him and we were like pen pals, I guess, mm -hmm. <laughs> of some sort. But he was very much and did over the course of the next decade was very much like a father to me in a lot of ways. Like, and having met me when I was 15, I felt like that because I was like, you knew me when I was a child. Right. You know, and so that was very much a yearn. You know, a lot of the things that I've done in my life has been a yearn for family. You know, getting into hardcore and becoming a skinhead in the 80s, that was very much like, where's my tribe? Yep. You know, <laughs> totally. yeah. um, you know, the Krishnas were a tribe and like coming out of that, I think, you know, I tried to put my identity in work and like, you know, being in a band and, and trying to like, I always joke that. 
the first time anyone clapped for me, it was like a revelation. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, this, I want more of this. That would have been, that was in a band experience, a band, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm trying to remember, I, I played drums in bands forever. I'm trying to, I mean, I don't remember that specific thing, but I remember, of course, just like, wow, the attention. I do this thing and people are like, they're interested in this. This right. is great. It's intoxicating. Yeah. Right. And I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 30 <Yeah>. years later. <laughs> That is interesting. So the Hare Krishna thing, so that was one version of family. But did you leave? It sounds like that wasn't very long. Well, I left as a monk, but I stayed as a practitioner okay. probably until about 2003. And I think that that was a huge turning point, I think, in every aspect of my life, especially as it comes to family. So I was hit by a tow truck. <laughs> I was... I'm uh, glad you can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Um, I mean, honestly, I always joke it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It really kind of was. I was living in Oakland at the time. I had just moved house and I was moving. I had just left my bike at my old apartment. So one morning I went back to the old apartment to get my bike and a tow truck sort of like took a turn and hit me. And um, I have no memory of it. I had traumatic brain injury oh, and like broken everything. And I was in the hospital for like two months. Oh. And... Uh, I was in the hospital for two months and I couldn't really walk for probably six. So I was very in bed a lot. <laughs> and when you are gifted with six months in bed, you know, you really start taking stock and thinking about what matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I realized was that I was like, this is Terry Krishna thing, I'm going through the motions. I don't even know that I believe in God. I, this is just right. sort of like, I really needed people yep. to be my family. <laughs> so there was that. And I was like, and no hard feelings. You know, when I had a conversation with my guru about it, you know, he was like, okay, well, we can be friends, right? And I was like, yeah. Really? So yeah. it's not like, I mean, I don't know that much about the religion, but it's not like, well, you're out forever and we can never talk again. It's Right. It's, it's, not, it's not the cult that people wanted it to be. Right. <laughs> it, it was very, yeah, it was very easy. He was, uh, you know, because it was nice, too, because he said, here's the thing, like, you like me, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, good, I like you, so we'll be friends. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> easy, <laughs> easy exit. Yeah. Right. But, so, but, you, but you left the religion. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was done. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but one of the other things that I did at that time, so because of the traumatic brain injury, I was in therapy with a neuropsychologist, which I'd never done before. Usually it's just, you know, LCSW therapy. type yeah, person, yeah. right? Um, but the neuropsychologist was really amazing because she was basically trying to create a situation for me where maybe we could somehow parse my lifelong sort of depression and sort of mental health issues what might be triggered by my traumatic brain injury and the situational stuff that creates the rub. Yeah. And as we were having these sessions and she was learning more about my family, <laughs> you know, it's, it, she was very much like, she was an amazing sort of provocator, but she basically was like, it sounds to me like the fact that they're at all in your life right now is a weight that you don't want to carry. And they, I, they being your parents, my, my entire family, honestly, okay. And, you know, the answer to that was yes, absolutely. It is a wait. Every time my phone rings and I see them, my heart sinks. Yeah. I can't do this. And so she said, what would make it right? And the answer was complicated. But essentially what I said was, I need for, I don't want an apology. What I want is an acknowledgement of what happened, an acknowledgement of my childhood, that it was real. <laughs> and uh, yeah. that it affected me. If my mother specifically is willing to go there, then I'm willing to be an adult and say, all is forgiven. Now, can we have an adult relationship based on unconditional love? Part of this would also be the fact that I never came out to her. So I would have to come out to her right. at this point. So my neuropsychologist basically walked me through every possible scenario in that discussion it's like training to have the discussion yeah wow. like it was basically like you know preparing me for every possible outcome right. and there was just a point where i was like okay i mean i'm as quote unquote prepared as someone can be it's just you know when is that door gonna open we'll see and that summer i got a call from my mom and she was you know trying to be i guess motherly <laughs> because i had just had this accident yeah. you know and she said to me basically i want to ask you something i said what 
She goes, I got the feeling that you didn't want me there. And I knew a little bit about what happened because my best friend basically became my advocate while I was in the hospital. Mm. My best friend, he, when we talk about family, he is 100% family to me. And he knows everything. Mm. So when my mother wanted to come visit, he got on the phone with her and said, that's a bad idea. Do not oh, okay. do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So he, he prepped her a bit for your conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so she basically wanted to know why he said that. Right. And so I said, okay, we can have this conversation, but I am going to start speaking. You are not going to interrupt me. And when I'm finished, you can say whatever you want. This is on a phone call. Yeah. And she's like, okay. So I went and I was sort of like a, this is your life kind of situation. I talked about my entire childhood. I came out to her. I did all these other things. And then I basically gave her a scenario, which I thought wasn't particularly egregious, <laughs> um, which was basically either, and this was after she had acknowledged. So she did the she acknowledgement. Did. Right she, there on that call. Yes, it happened like the stages of grief. Okay. <laughs> Denial, right, minimization. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> it, was, it was a, but it was a process, there. but she got there. Wow. She got there. And when she finally got there, I just felt, a relief. It was very like, it was what I'd, I'd been waiting my whole life to mm -hmm. just be acknowledged in that way. So once we got there, I said to her, if you want to have this relationship with me, it has to be based on unconditional love. It cannot be based on what you think I need to be or want me to be or anything that I'm not. I've never had this with you. And I would like to have this with you. So if this is something that you would like to have with me, call me back. If for whatever reason, this is something that you cannot have or don't want to have with me, don't call me back. And she said, is that an ultimatum? And I remember just being like, it shouldn't be. <laughs> right. <laughs> but fine. If you want to okay. look at it that way. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> like to me, that's wild. I don't have children, but I have God children. Right. And I couldn't imagine saying right wouldn't you just be like yes yes yeah like i there, yeah. there would be no phone call to make i'd right, be like right. look we're doing this yeah. <laughs> so yeah so anyway we got off the phone i felt like a million bucks yeah. honestly i was like i don't care what happens right you got some of what you wanted and you did it i got exactly what i wanted yeah. and if something else comes from it it'll come but Essentially, six months went by, wow. and I never got the call. And after six months, I was sort of like, okay, if she calls me now, I'm just going to be pissed. So I changed my phone number, and I called my attorney and started the process to legally change my name. Wow. And so that's why I have an Irish last name, and I'm not Irish. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you choose that name, or where did it come I, from? I chose it. It was... It was um, <laughs> I had Woodside weird roots. roots. No, so that's funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> I chose it for aesthetic purposes. It was weird. When I realized I was changing my name, you don't realize like how much of a name becomes you. Like I don't think I realized how much my birth name carried really. Mm. Even though I was conscious of it enough to want to change it, the process opened my eyes to a lot of feelings and sort of like emotions even with just the way that people never pronounced it right <laughs> or just things like that where I was just like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, mm -hmm. like I wanted ownership. So one of the things that sort of went into the process were one, I was just like, I, I just wanted a name that's easy to pronounce so that nobody fucks it up because that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Two is that it, it needed to be quote unquote ethnically ambiguous which basically meant Brannon, I could get away with, but like McGinnis, no. Right, right, okay, yeah. <laughs> right? And honestly, I looked at Latin names, but that felt weirder to me because it felt like I was adopting someone else's story. Hmm. Like I was like, no one's going to believe I'm Irish, but you right, know, somebody might believe that I'm Cuban right. or something. You know what I mean? Like it's, it felt more weighty and so it felt more like latin drag or something like right, i was right. just like this doesn't feel right and so that's why i ended up with brannon it was just a oh, name that aesthetically i liked yeah. and i was like okay let's go for it fuck it wow and also it just if i fuck this name up it's my fault that's the other thing huh like that other name messed up for life right right and it was and, messed up before i got and here. in the past yeah. <laughs> yeah right so i i just was like whatever name this is 
I have to take care of it. And so did you ever hear from your mother? No. Wow. Never. And I eventually, so, you know, I relate to what you're talking about with 23 and Me. Uh, because one of the questions I obviously had was, where the hell is my father from? Yeah, right. <laughs> what happened before them? Yeah. So I did do the Ancestry.com. Uh, I did this after I knew they were dead. So, and I knew they were dead because I Googled it. And apparently there are websites that take pictures of people's what you, headstones, I guess. Um, oh, okay. And so like I have pictures I of- I going to say bodies. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would okay. be dark. Headstones. No, headstones. headstones. Yeah. But I have like pictures of my mother's headstone and pictures of my father's headstone. So I knew that they were dead. I knew that my mom died first and then my dad died a little bit later. That was a little bit difficult for me, not in a grieving sense, because I feel like I grieved right. a long time ago. The, the loss had happened. Yeah. As yeah. far as I was concerned, they were dead when, they, when that happened. So when they died again, I was sort of like, okay, well, whatever. But, <laughs> but That's official. Yeah. But there was one thing that sort of, you know, irked me, which was my mom had died and my dad lived maybe for, I want to say four more years. And because of the fact that as an adult, I had come to maybe forgive my dad a little bit more for not protecting me, it would have been nice to have that last period of time yeah. to, to reconnect and to maybe understand him a little bit more because the secrecy and, and sort of, you know, obviously like I know that he was never home and I know that he worked a lot and I don't begrudge him for that. He was doing what needed to be done. Um, but it also sort of robbed me of a chance to really get to know him or, or put my finger on certain questions that right. I had. Yep. So when I knew they were dead, it was weird. Ancestry.com just sent me an email and was like, right. It's cause we're you're on, on sale. It's cause you're on that great, you're on the grave <laughs> website. Yeah. It's all they know. cookies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably run that site. Yes. yes probably. <laughs> but so, yeah. So I, I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. So I did it and, um, you know, it came back and it was like, yep. My mother's side, pure Iberian, mm -hmm. Portuguese, Spanish done. And some little bit of indigenous Colombian in the mix, somewhere in the mix. I was like, okay, cool. Um, and then my dad's side, purely indigenous. Mm. So I was like, why is that a secret? Like I get like, I could, I, well, I couldn't understand it. I started researching indigenous populations of Chile and I started trying to figure it out. And apparently 80% of the indigenous population of Chile belongs to the Mapuche people. And I thought, okay, 80% seems like a pretty good number for me to guess that maybe I'm right. connected to this. Right, right. And so I started researching the Mapuche. I started reading and finding documentaries and, and sort of just like figuring it out. And one thing that I found that I thought was interesting was that around the time that my dad was born, maybe a little before or a little bit after, was a time in Chile where, first of all, the Chilean government and the Mapuches have been fighting forever, but the Mapuches have been winning for centuries. <laughs> And they had just suffered their first major military defeat around the time that my dad was born. And apparently a number of Mapuche people moved to the city and sort of started passing. And there was this element of, we're just going to be Chilean. Right. Right. <laughs> like we're going to give up our oppressed identities yeah. <laughs> and just try to live our lives. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a part of me that wonders where in that story, maybe my father could have fit. Maybe right. his family decided to create this alternate identity of you were born in Santiago. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe he felt some need to create that identity for himself. Maybe he doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't know. Yeah. There's a lot to that question that, you know, I'll never know. Wow. And it's sad also because I feel like obviously reading about the Mapuche is very like inspiring. And it's like the idea that I might be connected to these people is very intoxicating. Like right. I like, oh, wow, this, these people are great. Right, right, right. <laughs> what, look at this culture. This is amazing. And like, um, but I'll never know. 80% chance, though. 80%, but I'll still good. never know. <laughs> Just take it. Just jump in. <laughs> well, but the, that's, the, that's the other harsh thing about, you know, having indigenous blood is that it almost doesn't matter. Right. You need to be in the culture. Mm -hmm. You need to sort mm -hmm. of be of the people and of the land right. to really claim it. And I can't. So 
it's always going to feel like this part of me that isn't part of me. Mm -hmm. So it sort of just brings back that, that level of complete ambiguity, I think, that mm -hmm. I've always had to my identity. So what is family to you? So this is where it gets heady. About now, maybe 15 years ago now. So I dropped out of school and I left and did all that. About 10 or 15 years ago, I decided to go back to school. And I went to college and I got a bachelor's and I got a master's and I did my master's in linguistics. And I did my master's thesis about a language called Polari. Polari is a language that was spoken or it's, I'd say most predominantly spoken in the late 19th century and early 20th century, mostly in England and around the ports and the Mediterranean ports. Mm. It was a language that evolved over hundreds of years, usually through sailors, sometimes through circus people, sometimes through gypsies, sometimes travelers, through yeah, travelers. Right. Yeah. But eventually somehow it sort of became adopted by queer people. And by the late 19th century, it became almost exclusively used by queer people. And in the early 20th century, it became almost just the language people spoke. It wasn't a language in the sense that it had a distinct grammar, because that would be crazy. But because that just doesn't happen. In linguistics, they, t they talk about how languages evolve usually over time and through children. It's a mm -hmm. generational thing that happens through children. That's when a pigeon becomes a creole. But... Polari didn't have children speakers. It was only adult speakers, queer adult speakers. So over time, as I was creating like a corpus of examples of Polari, which is really difficult to find because it's not like people wrote books in Polari. And so I had to transcribe radio shows and it was, it was a whole thing. At any rate, I started to find these examples of Polari that I couldn't understand, meaning that this was no longer English grammar with just words thrown in. Mm. So, right, so an example of Polari would be the most popular sentence is, how bona tavada your eek. And that means, how lovely to see you, right? What that is, is it's English grammar with Polari words put in there. So bona means good, right. vada means see, eek means face. So that's the way it was. But I'm finding all these examples of Polari where they're not using English grammar. And they were still discernible to Polari speakers. And that lit this light in my head because that's supposed to be impossible in linguistics. And when I started to think about the fact that had this language persisted, it could have reasonably developed its own grammar based on these little examples that were starting to come up towards the end. And I should say Polari died essentially after homosexuality was legalized in England. The new generation- so like the 60s, right? Like not that long 1969, ago, 1969, right? yeah. I wanna say. Okay. Or 67. But it was, yeah, the new generation basically looked at Polari and was like, that's some closet shit. We're not talking like that. We don't need to talk like that. We can talk regular. <laughs> and they didn't see it as this amazing cultural product of, you know, fortitude and resilience and, and ingenuity right. that queer people had over centuries, which is a shame. Right. And so, but when I started to, to realize that Polari had legs, so to speak, then I started to think, what if queer people had their own language? What if that became a thing? Like, what would that say about the relationship that queer people have with each other? What would that say about whether or not, you know, we talk so much about things like chosen family, and I hate that term mm -hmm. because I feel like it's, there's something about it that feels so arbitrary and whimsical. Right. Like, I believe that people are inherently connected, and you know it when you feel it. And that's blood-related or non-blood-related. That's cultural or non-cultural. That's ethnic or non-ethnic. It just is. It's a feeling. And so I started to think about queerness as an ethnicity. I started to think about it as my primary ethnicity because I realized that I taught a, a course at Brooklyn College about, it was called Immigration, Ethnicity, and Literature. Or something like that. So, uh, and it was mostly novels that obviously dealt with immigration or ethnicity or things like the right. things that I obviously have some experience with. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, I used to always talk to the students and I'd be like, the difference between race and ethnicity is that race is how you're perceived when you walk out the door. So when I walk out the door, it doesn't matter if I'm Mexican, Puerto Rican, you know, I've been 
people thought I'm Indian. People have thought I'm, there are a million things. It doesn't matter. The point is I'm brown, <laughs> and, right. and that's you're, that's you're what people not see. White. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's race because we, as we know, race doesn't exist. It's how you're perceived. <laughs> Ethnicity, though, there there were these. Um, I started to read these. Uh, ethnographers from Sweden, whose names I can't recall now, but uh, they were making this argument that ethnicity is self-determined, mm. that ethnic groups are formed by the ethnic group when they begin to realize the differences between them and the groups around them. And I really sort of like that captured my imagination when it came to queerness, because I started to think of queer people as having all of the telltale signs of ethnic groups, mm. right? Like, it's funny, I talk to a lot of Jewish friends and they're always like, oh, I see it completely. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, which makes you sense. Yeah, like yeah. for them, because like, I, feel, I feel like Jews really understand ethnicity mm-hmm. in a way that's very strong. And, yeah. and, and so I've had a lot of interesting conversations with uh, my Jewish friends about it. But that speaks to me in a way that I think is deeper because I feel like it's the first lens with which I use to navigate the world. Being Latino is not. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because I feel so disconnected from my family. But that's just the way it turned out. And so when I walk out into the world, I prioritize my queerness. And by extension of that, the people that I surround myself with and the people that I sort of really aim to connect with are often queer. And then on top of that, the thing that I feel like really makes us the ethnic group is that when I sit down with a queer person, there are things about my experience that don't need explanation. And I mean, that's family to me. Thanks for tuning in. Please consider subscribing to Identified wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. And be sure to check out Identified on YouTube and identifiedpod.com where you can watch videos from our interviews. Our executive producer is Kieran Banerjee, and the show is produced by Palm Tree Island. The music for Identified is by Noella and Patricia Brennan. I'm Nabil Ayers. Thanks for tuning in.